Good afternoon. I'm Rex Buchanan, former director of the Kansas Geological Survey. Today is December 28th, 2023. We're here today to interview John O. Farmer III for the Kansas Oral History Project. Our videographer is Michael Quaid. We thank Mr. Farmer for hosting this interview in his company's boardroom in Russell, Kansas. John is the chairman of the oil and gas production company named after his father, John O. Farmer Incorporated. He's a 1963 graduate of the Missouri School of Mines where he earned a bachelor's degree in petroleum engineering. In 1995, John was awarded a professional degree in petroleum and geological engineering by the University of Missouri Rolla. John's work as an engineer began two years with two years of active duty with the Army Corps of Engineers in Germany after graduating from college. Once back in the U.S., he went to work for Shell Oil Company, where he held several positions. John left Shell in 1969 and joined his father's oil and gas production company, John O. Farmer Incorporated in Russell. He served as president of the company from 1989 until 2015, when his son became president. John was president of the Kansas Independent Oil and Gas Association in 1998-99. This interview is part of the Kansas Oral History Projects series examining the development of public policy at the nexus of energy and the environment during the late 20th and early 21st centuries. In these interviews, we explore these policies through the eyes of experts, executives, administrators, legislators, environmentalists, and others. The Kansas Oral History Project is a nonprofit corporation created to collect and preserve oral histories of Kansans, who were involved in shaping and implementing public policy. Recordings and transcripts of these oral history interviews are accessible online at ksoralhistory.org and through the Kansas Historical Society and the State Library of Kansas. Kansas Oral History Project is supported by donations from generous individuals and grants from Evergy and ITC Great Plains. Thank you, John, for agreeing to share your insights with us today, and thank you, Michael, for providing your videography skills. So with that, John, let's talk a little bit. Let's start a little bit about your career. Uh, obviously, you're from this area. You go to school, you go to work for Shell, but you come back here for your father. Talk a little bit about your father and this company. Yeah, it's a lot of incredible stories, and ours is one of many. And, you know, the, the old guys did it right, I, I tell you. Uh, they, my father graduated from Missouri School of Mines in 1933. I graduated 30 years later. But our family was from Missouri, and he, a uh, little town of Willard, Missouri, and he, his father ran a general store. John O. Farmer I ran a general store, and during the Depression went broke giving loans to people that couldn't pay their bills. My father's inheritance was a cigar box full of IOUs. <laughs> so he, he jumped, he graduated in 1929 at $50 and went to Rolla and became a petroleum engineer. He worked for Carter for a while. And then uh, he worked for Otis Pressure Control uh, Division of Halliburton. He was their first engineer. And uh, had, he had an incredible career. He invented the storm choke for Otis. And uh, it's used all over the world. So, so they, uh, they formed a company it was called Jones, Shelburne, and Farmer. And there were some real superstars there. Um, my father and uh, Shelburne was my uncle who had been in the oil business uh, since the 30s. And Fred Jones... Uh, was an orphan with a third grade education. He was good friends with Henry Ford. And he, his, he wanted to get enough money together to build a f assembly plant, a Ford assembly plant. And he did it in Oklahoma City. And he then uh, went into the oil business with us. And he started another oil company. He was also the founder of Braniff Airlines. So this guy was what you call a serious business guy. There's a statue of him downtown Oklahoma City, and that which is very unusual. But he was 
they came in 1946 when we began. It was a year after uh, World War II, and the Congress had passed taxes to up to a 94% tax bracket, and it was a great incentive to uh, for people uh, with a whole lot of money to invest in, in if they got dry holes. And there was a, a lot of the early drilling was based on tax money, in fact, for years. And we did actually some random drilling. And uh, we did a project, for instance, with Phillips Petroleum, and dr we drilled on school land in Nebraska. Which is all, and we found the Sleepy Hollow Sand, but we didn't find the Sleepy Hollow Pool. But we, that's how they did it. And uh, I've father was in Oklahoma City visiting with an old-time geologist who went to Harvard and at the end of they had lunch together he said say Jono I have an idea and he, he he pulled out a napkin he said south of Norton there was a dry hole drilled and he said it tested 400 feet of water but I ran the samples on it and it uh, it had a show of oil on it he said about five miles up here, there was a well drill that had no arbuckle. He took his napkin and he took a ballpoint pen and drew a big circle. And he said, I think somewhere in there is a stratigraphic arbuckle trap. Dad takes that and sticks it in his pocket. He comes back here, and based on that information, they leased it and drilled it, and they found the Norton. <clears throat> It was uh, 125 Arbuckle wells. Average recovery, 100,000 barrels per well. So that was a that was a the most serious discovery, and the KG has wrote several books on it. So now, is he headquartered here in Russell at this time? At that time, we started in Great Bend. Okay, and then uh, we had all this drilling was in the Russell area. We only had one car. <laughs> Couldn't afford an, another car. We actually lived in a hotel for, and I was a little guy. In Great Bend. In Great Bend, one year. And this is this is what year, roughly? Uh, Forty six. Okay. Forty six, forty seven. We All came right. here, and it was this was really a boom town. All, it was in Russell. In Russell, it okay. really was. Uh, Central Kansas uplift really is uh, uh, drilling around here. Really gets going in a big way. I mean. About then, and then the early '50s, especially, right? Yes, okay. and we're you know this carry up. We're we're now celebrating the hundredth anniversary of Carry Oswald was right. discovered on Thanksgiving Day last year, and last Thanksgiving, and it's a hundred year. And we're our, we've had parades celebrating in our Christmas parade. There were quite a lot of. So was he then was and and at that by this point he has his own company by himself in the late forties. Your father? No, no, no. No, he's still. They, no, uh, they agreed uh, to buy each other out at death. They agreed on a formula, and they were all still alive. Okay. But uh, and so then he starts to do. Does he do then, in addition to the stuff, say in Norton, right around here, or how does everywhere, it everywhere, yeah? Uh, and it was, uh, I'm amazed at the amount of oil those guys found. It was just, they had a nose for it. Well, they're also starting to use some of the newer techniques to go out using seismic and stuff like that to start to to look in ways. In we actually started a seismic company in the fifties. And uh, it, single point seismic. We owned truck. We bought truck. We put together trucks and everything, and did that for a while. And then we gave the, the seismic stuff to Missouri School of Mines. Okay. And you have memories of that as a kid. Did yes. you go out in the field with your yes. dad and that I, kind of thing? I can remember spending Christmas Day in a doghouse <laughs> with my Christmas. I mean, it was it, it was the real deal. Uh -huh. And busy, you know had these phones at home, you know, you can imagine it, operating three or four rigs, how busy he was. So I got a good whiff of it. Uh, when, when I look at maps of this area, 
the, the number of holes around here is just incredible. And I think I've read this is one of the most densely drilled geologic provinces anywhere. I mean, there are, that must have been quite a time. Uh, yeah. They were, these wells were drilled with cable tools. Right. And they, it would take about a month to drill a cable tool well. And then they finally got to rotaries, and you could drill it in about a week. But we, for instance, this uh, uh, pool uh, where the Kerry Oswald was, uh, it's been pretty well drilled up, but it, the feature itself is a huge lancing anticline. And, and a couple, about 10 years ago, we went on the north side of it, and we, we went off the anticline to see if we could find Arbuckle or Simpson sand. And I, I was a little bit nervous when we drilled the first well, and we were 35 feet low on the lancing. But we did find Arbuckle, and we did find Simpson sand. It, and it incredibly good production, and we used uh, 3D seismic to, to imagine an ancient shoreline that for the Simpson sand. It wasn't very big, but the wells were very prolific. So that kind of made us feel good to be able to do that in an old area. Back in the 50s, they would have been using seismic, but there was also a lot of step-out development, and, uh, and then, I suppose, then just some plain old-fashioned wildcatting kinds of stuff, right? Uh, did you guys have your own drill rigs? or were We you... had five of them. For... Really? <laughs> wow. we, we came here, and we were spending uh, Fred Jones' money. <laughs> we had five rigs, so we got after We were a serious inf uh, new kid on the block back in those days. That must have been kind of a wild time. Wasn't yeah, it? it was really wild. My... My father had a wonderful job in uh, with Otis Pressure Control in Dallas. I was born in Dallas, and uh, he was our first engineer. And a few years later, he had a hundred engineers working for him, including Red Adair. He hired Red yeah. Adair, yeah. And then uh, he had this opportunity. He came up here, and that when he arrived, he found out my mother was pregnant. <laughs> they drilled thirteen straight dry holes. <laughs> so they did get off to a very fast start, so it, it's quite a quite a story. So, you, but you didn't immediately move into the family company, right? No, I wanted to. I got a. I went to a really good school, and I actually got worked for Shell before I, in right. college. Okay. But it and I wanted to get some major oil company experience, and boy, did I get it. I worked with them about six years. I spent six months in their various schools in Houston, a wonderful education. And I was, in Oklahoma, we were drilling air gas drilling in eastern Oklahoma and Arkansas. We, I was watching 20,000 foot wells, so, and, and uh, you know, and then I go to Illinois and put in a aqueous sulfonate water flood and then to, on to Wyoming and Montana and work on big projects. So you're really getting a, uh, a background in a lot of different geologic yes. areas compared yes. to what the world would look like yes. here. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, you know, with Shell, money's no problem. I would recommend things and they spend half a million dollars, come back to Russell and I'm thinking about running a packer in the well weather. Save a few hundred dollars, you know. It, it just it was a different world, but it was a wonderful training ground for me. So why then did you come back when you did? And this is 1966. Is that what I? Uh, 69. 69. I was mo moving well with Shell. I'd have done okay with him, but my dream was to be here. So from day one, I was is that right? Yeah. And by now, the company was born. I was. Began when I was six years old, and I claimed to be okay. part of it at age six. I mean, there was no question what I wanted to do. Really? Yeah. Uh, so when you came in, how, came, when you came back and went to work, or in effect, you're working for your father, right? There was no problem. He had I, I put together some large unitized water floods, and it became apparent to him real quick that I knew a whole lot more about it than he, and he just turned it over, you know. So we complimented each other very well. And it was a, we worked together 20 years and then he passed away. I've worked with my other John 33 years. So we have 
wonderful family relationships. So by the time you come back, uh, how, how come, uh, let's talk a little bit about secondary recovery and water flooding. Are, by the time you come back, is that fairly, are most people doing that in this yeah. area? So it's a fairly common technique. Yeah, and I was, that's what I specialized in. Okay. Reunitization and uh, water flooding. I did a lot of that, including the big projects in Cedar Creek, Anticline, and Montana. So uh, that was, and but they were pretty easy. They're small water floods, but pretty easy. We're still doing it today. We're we're buying we're buying properties that we think we can improve, and uh, a lot of it's water flooded. And so, in in some respects, that background comes in really handy when you come back here. It really handy because kind of the days of that big primary production yep. are over, or right. probably pretty close to over by the time you come back. That's right. It? So, water flooding then is kind of a way to. To keep after it in a big way, right? Yeah, it's not a big way, but we have diversified. But we, our heart is in the oil business. It'll always be. We want. I want to. After I'm gone, I want this office to keep going. I think it will. So, uh, when so, <laughs> you said you worked for your father for twenty years. Mm -hmm. How did that work? Were you always? Was he always in charge of the company until? When, when totally. He, when, no. When he he would go south for a long vacation, I just run the company. We had total confidence in each other, and uh, there was no second guessing. I had the same relationship with my son. So when you begin to do that, in addition to this, to the water flooding kinds of projects, anything else that, that we did I, directions you moved uh, did a, a lot of uh, property purchases. I was pretty good at that. We're still pretty good at it, where we can buy, we bought drying oil. It was a pretty good size cut, and we stayed right with it and uh, improved it. They got a fair price. We got a fair price. It was paid out, and we're doing some water flooding and drilling on it. So that's just right down our alley. What we don't, what we don't want to do is what Warren Buffett calls Cigarette butt investing. We pick up the portion of the cigarette, take a couple puffs, and it's over with. We we want properties with a life to them. So you've seen a ton of changes in the industry oh, yeah. over this time. You've also seen a bunch of these boom bust cycles. Yeah. I mean, I'd have to sit here and think a little bit about how many you've been through, but you've been through some yeah. some pretty severe ones. Are you buying those other companies on the on the downside of some of those cycles, or is it just we try we try to do the best we can to manage the risk and be aware of where the prices are. The worst, you know, we just want to focus on good quality projects and pay a fair price for them. But we want them to be long lived if possible. Uh, when I was Kyoga president. Uh, 79 to 99. The whole price went down to $9. And here I'd been here for 30 years. And everything we had was not worth anything. I mean, it was devastating. That was the year when some of the oil people from Great Bend marched on Topeka. You know, it, was just, it was a disaster. And I, I, we spent a lot of time. We drafted a, an agreement where we'd take it out to the landowners and agree to just shut in all the wells. And we did that for a couple of years. And that, that, that 99, and then I thought, man, this, I'm gonna turn out the lights. This thing's over with. And then something happened. A year later, I saw a size 3D seismic that Murfin did north of Hayes. And I couldn't believe it. I could, it, it was a narrow arbuckle fields and they could see it, you know. And I said, it's right here, right now. And that, we, one year we didn't drill anything. The next year we drilled one 3D well and we got it. Then the next year we drilled 10. We got nine out of 10. And then we were off. And we, we drilled 30, 40 wells a year, a 3D seismic, and the oil price was going up. And we had 12 years of 
great recovery on a drilling program that was just a busy program. We weren't really creating any wealth. We were now creating wealth. And so that was, a, that was something else to see that kind of a change. We're kind of back now, a very unstable price. And uh, we're, the 3D, 3D is a mature play. You're just finding acreage you want to go after. It's probably been shot. So let's go back to the, uh, the bus part of the cycle a little bit. And, and you don't just go through that in the 90s. It also is a period in the oh, 80s. I, my right? whole life we were going through that. Up, up and down. Yeah. Uh, what, it has not just an effect on you as an operator, but you drive through all these little towns and all they used to have service companies. Yeah, yeah. And through those bus in the 80s and yeah. 90s, yeah. they go away. Yeah. Uh, we made a huge decision in 1990 to diversify. And we, we started out in the stock market because the stock market moved in opposite directions of the oil price over a long period. And we, we did that and we thought we can use the same technique we used to buy oil property to buy stocks or to buy other companies. And we did that. And we, we've done really well with that. One of the things that and I remember in that period in, that you're talking about in the 90s when oil price, when prices got down to $9 a barrel, I remember talking with a friend of mine and the consensus was oil will never go below $20 a barrel ever again because there's, you know, there, there's sort of this sense of peak oil and there's shortages. And yeah. it, and prices, peak oil was a shell, a uh, uh, shell guy prices, that did it, yeah. yeah. Prices can never yeah. go low yeah. again and then they turn around and yeah. they did. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you we, did. We rode that for a long time. We did that. But fortunately, we were a mature enough company. Was We didn't do anything really stupid, and we could afford to do that. Uh, that boom and bust cycle, and, and, and we'll back up again here in a second, but one thing, then it really manifested itself in... Oh, let's call it 2009, 2010, when when people go crazy down in Oklahoma and it comes up in Mississippi and play mm -hmm. comes. Mm -hmm. Did that did that affect you very much this far north in that process? No, we had no production in that area. But I will tell you, when I was with Shell, we they were drilling near the town of Hennessy in northern Oklahoma, and I was watching a well there, and they were, you could drill almost anywhere in that area, and you. You would have huge gas. Well, I mean, fifty million, and it would last about a year, and then it would turn to oil. And we were coring that Mississippi at a forty-five degree angle, and I was out on this well, catching those cores and describing them, and carrying them back into core lab. And Shell determined that there was not enough matrix porosity to hold. Any reserves, uh, and that was a long time ago when we did that. So I got my eyes open then, and on the, uh, I went down there and looked at the play, but I just didn't, I was worried about it, and I, I really thought all the money that those majors spent on that, and Shell was, if they'd have had some old-time Kansas geologists describe the Mississippi, they may not have done that. I watched that thing really close, and I mean, well, a lot of people did. It looked to me like it quickly went from something that made some sense to something that didn't make any sense. But there were a lot of bad decisions that got made in that process. Yeah. I looked down. Yeah. Like. Shell made a bad decision. They, among other people, yeah. and it drove up leasing prices in places. Oh, for two hundred, our leases went from ten dollars an acre to two hundred, and it really slowed things. All what it did is slowed everything down. It, Right. There was no significant, uh, Cause, cause so we could. missed it. We, you know, now I have some friends in Oklahoma that are drilling horizontally and fracking, but it's a variety of zones like granite wash and different zones, and they're doing it successfully. But that's a that's a special game you play. But, yeah, and, and before we back up again a little bit, do you do much in terms of horizontal activity? No, okay. we we have. 
participated on a, a well in Montana, northern Montana, but, uh, about five miles from Canada, and we set pipe on it, Bakken well, and we started completing the thing, and it was 50 below zero. <laughs> started fracking that thing, and it, fortunately, it was a clean, dry hole. It would have been a nightmare to have a marginal well. You want a clean, dry, but we were trying to manufacture oil, you know. And uh, I just determined that's not a play. We're not a big enough company to do that. And I'd rather be diversified. Than okay. Not. So let's talk a little bit about your company today. You just said Montana. How much out of state stuff do you do? Not a lot. Okay. But we have friends that it, this was a very unusual thing. That, but uh, we pretty much are here. We have a long, we have long time relationship with some operators in Oklahoma. Okay. But, so let's. So where are you sort of geographically distributed today in Kansas? What, what are the areas you work in mostly? Well, I believe it, uh, the, our traditional area here, right Ellis right Russell. Here. And uh, the cost of wells, incidentally. We did a, recently did a well right outside Hayes, and the cost to drill and equip a 3,200-foot well was $450,000. That's double what it used to be. We also were active uh, in Wabunsee County and uh, in Lyon County. We have some really nice... Uh, Simpson sand wells, and we got a hold of some surface geology, worked the surface geology to come up with the idea of where we might do a 3D, and we did that, and it, we were fortunate enough to have it work a couple of times. But these are small fields, and you can't you can't do enough activity to keep you busy. So you've got some activity in eastern Kansas, but you're mostly out here. Yeah. What uh, is, is that the big difference is uh, just size of operation or I, I like you know I like to run a tight I like to be near the operations uh, and I you know we could start operating in Colorado or, or something we have the, we could do that but you stretch your people and I'd rather have a, a tight company where we can really control operations and I tell you where I learned that. We, we used to have pulling units, and we had some wells down by Medicine Lodge, and we set our pulling units down there to work on a well. And we got a call from the motel owner. One of these guys had a little too much to drink and drove his pickup into the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> we decided we didn't want to get into all of that anymore, so we... And, and, you know, you, you want to be where you can tightly control. Keep, keep an eye on it. Yeah, yeah, it was funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the guys that did that, Dad was still alive. And they thought, oh, we're going to get fired. And they came in to see John Owen. He said, boys, let's don't do that the, again. <laughs> that, 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 that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how, what, it, it, how many people did you have? Working for the company at a, at a maximum time, and when was that, roughly? Oh, golly. Uh, we have a lot of, most of the contract contracts. So most of the people are contract. Uh, we we have, oh, maybe 25 people full time. Okay. And uh, that varies a little bit. But we had more than that. And there, when uh, this point, when I told you, when we had the recovery, we the 12 year recovery. We went to, up from paying not much severance tax to a million dollars a year severance. To it with. Well, that was that's fair. We were making money. We were having success, and it's time to pay your fair share of taxes. I don't mind that at all. But you can't tax these little bitty wells. And, like, well, so since you brought it up, let's let's talk about that a, a little bit because uh, one of the points of this series is to to look at sort of historical events. And the passage of the severance tax in Kansas was was one of those. Were you involved in any way of the, in the politics in that process? 
I, I was not involved. I, I was Cuyahoga president, in, you know, 25 years ago. You know, so I, I wasn't involved in that. But, but uh, I will just tell you, I think our state is a great place to work and raise a family, and and I think the taxes are fair. Uh, I think our commission is fair. They're honest, good people, and. The, KGS is something to be really proud of. It's just a great place to work. So when that severance tax comes along, this is the late 70s, John Carlin, late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, he wasn't my favorite person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there's no question there was resistance in yeah. the oil and gas business to the severance yeah. tax. But it w they were going to get it because Oklahoma had it. I mean, it was going to happen. So... Uh, but the ad valorem's tax was always a huge burden. We, we figured that the ad valorem tax, we would lose a month's income just to pay ad valorem taxes. And then to come in with a severance tax, that was uh, per pretty tough. But what we did do is we got a small well exemption, and boy, that really helped. And this, uh, this year we're paying about Three hundred seventy thousand dollars in ad valorem tax, and about a hundred thousand in, uh, in severance tax. Yeah, in severance tax. And partly the reason for that exemption is people that don't know anything about the oil and gas business, particularly in Kansas, have this impression of the oil business as, as a big company business like mm -hmm. Shell. Kansas is not like that. No. And I don't know what the average well production in the state is today. But it's not very much because there are an awful lot of low producing See, wells. That's right. The assumption is you can't afford to pay to pump, to operate those, and pay ta much in the way of taxes on them, or else you're just, not, you're just going to shut them in. That's right. So that's why that exemption is so important. You know, I have a friend whose family goes back to drilling in Pennsylvania, and he owns a lease in Pennsylvania that was drilled in 1900. So that's how long some of those, if you, if you, doing stripper wells, two barrel a day is kind of like farming poor ground. Your return isn't very much, but you've got those wells, you've got thousands of them, and they, they you know, they employ people, they're each kind of their own little economic development program, and they're worth keeping. And if you have gravity drainage and you're making very little water and the wells are mechanically sound, they'll sit there and pump for a long, long time. And conversely, if you shut those in because you can't afford to keep pumping them, the odds are pretty high you're never going to go back in there again. Yeah. So that's why those those price fluctuations are killers. Are such a big deal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of the big political fight, that severance tax fight in the late 70s, early 80s, yeah. kind of the big thing. Any other kinds of those kinds of policy issues? You said something about uh, when there was $9 a barrel, people wanted, people were marching on Topeka. What mm -hmm. were they What were they expecting? I didn't. I was Cuyahoga president. Okay. And they, I found out, and I thought, oh, my God, what, what do I do? You know, there, you know. Those guys aren't responsible for what's happened, sure. and uh, I didn't go. And I got myself in a little hot water with some of my friends because I wasn't there. But I didn't know. But I, they did the right thing. They were just totally frustrated. They would lose everything, and people listened. You know, and that, that's a nice thing about Kansas. We're kind of in this together, and you're all one of us. So were they just act, were they asking for tax relief? What what were they asking for in that period? They didn't. There were several different bills for tax relief, and the, the thing we did get through uh, is some t tax le tax relief on the ad valorem tax that was significant that helped us through a really difficult time, and it was needed because you know we had now two taxes and. It was significant, and we're operating pretty well with that. So uh, one of the themes of these conversations that we've had with people is 
about decision making on the state level, but also decision making on the federal level. Uh, which is more challenging? Which has a bigger impact on you, federal decisions or states? Federal. No why, why so? Uh, I, we just assume they don't know our business. <laughs> <laughs> And I hate I hate to say that I don't want to criticize it, but we that's you know right off the bat. If we deal with you, we, you're Kansan, you know you're one of us, and they aren't. And you know we we <laughs> so so how does that, how does that express itself on the federal level? Tax policy, environmental regulation, how we, what, that's most important to you. Uh, some of the program, the one we fear right now is a tax on gas, on methane. It, 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 these little bitty wells, are near, they're just dead. There is hardly any gas. And in the, there are some, a few of the better wells that have gas that probably need to be captured. And done, But I hope we don't plug a bunch of these little bitty wells that uh, there's not enough gas to matter. And I don't. We'll just see how that goes. And the, the, the so, wildlife thing, we, we think some of that is related to drought, you know. So I'm kind of out of that. I've been out of that for a while. But in a lot of respects, it's more environmental regulation yeah. than, say, taxation yeah. kinds of yeah. regulation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we just hope, you know, these are very fragile wells, and we don't want to make them uneconomic by doing something that's really kind of ridiculous. A lot of that federally is driven through EPA, right. which expresses itself in Kansas somewhat through Kansas Department of Health and Environment, right. somewhat through KCC. But in effect, what you feel like is it's easier for you to talk to folks on that state level than it is well, there's no question for, about for, it. for the national. They, they understand our problems, and most of them, or geologists, or have some background in what they're doing, and uh, that's a big plus. Well, so what are the biggest environmental challenges to working in this part of the world where you've been most active? Do you think unplugged wells? Okay, and I've got uh, right now, and it it's needed when you want to put in a water flood. And you want to select an injection well. They 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 look at the plugged wells around it, and if it's it, those wells have to be properly plugged. Now that's a good decision that protects the environment. But it, from our standpoint, it will eliminate some water floods. If we go in a heavily drilled area, and the and we have to replug a bunch of wells, we're not going to do it. We just will not do the project because it's expensive out here. It's very expensive, it. and it makes it not feasible. And for the most part, these are wells that, that in effect are your responsibility. They're not orphan wells sitting out there with a the landowner that you don't know who it is. That, that's not what I mean. I mean, they're, they're, they're wells you would have to pay to plug yourself. Yeah. The state's not going to pay to plug. No, I don't think so. Point. No. Okay. We, uh, we got stuck with plugging a well that kind of hurt my feelings, but I, we did it. But if you look, I want to buy a lease. By a shields lease out here, and we know it. You can water flood some Lansing zone. Before we try to buy that lease, we're going to look at all the plugged wells and see if we're creating a problem. So, because and it needs to happen. It so needs, they it, they're doing the right thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think everybody would agree on that. Yeah. And it is nice to see a big influx of federal money to go chase those yeah. orphan wells. Yeah. But because. A lot of the activity really gets underway out here in the 1920s. There are probably a lot of wells that there's not a lot of good records for, right? Yeah. Isn't that the, yeah. the situation? And so you have to worry about those in addition to the ones that you do. Yeah, that's know right. About. Some of them are not properly plugged. Right. The, in the, the old cable two wells, you know, they, an outfit out of, I think Denver tried to put together a CO2 project south of town. I don't know if you knew of that or. Right. And uh, they couldn't unitize it. So the, the, all these little bitty pumper type company, would, they, they couldn't put it together. And then they started working on these wells, and they were a nightmare 
mechanically, you know. So it, it just, we did another project. Murphy did a project and <clears throat> in the Lansing, I think, C-Zone. They were, had a pilot injection well and had all these wells surrounding it. And they got a response about a mile away on somebody else. So that, that's... Well, one of the issues that, that, that we dealt with in terms of improperly plugged wells out here is then dissolution of the salt and, yeah. and subsidence that gets associated yeah. with it. Have you ever had to deal with any of that kind of thing with properties you've, you've worked on? No, but I, there was many years ago, you, you could actually get a permit to, to let salt water set in an open right. pit. Yeah. And it was legal. I mean, you just... Right. And, we, the farmer thought we had ruined his water, and I thought, oh, brother. And we, they went out and went, did a bunch of core drilling, and we didn't have to re restore it, but I was really worried. And we were, went, didn't do anything illegal. You know? Right. Yeah. Down where I grew up, those, they, we called them evaporation pits. Right. You'd pump salt water into it, right. and, and everybody said it evaporated. Yeah. Sometimes it did, yeah. and sometimes... It didn't. Yeah. I, and I'm real familiar with those, and, and we're stealing, still, still dealing with that issue down in the Burton area where there's a lot of that kind of yeah. development. I didn't think about it so much up in this part of the world. Were those kind of pits pretty common up in here? No, I don't think so. I this, didn't think this, so either. This was in Barber County. Okay, so it's further south. Okay, yeah, quite yeah. a ways down there. Yeah. Because that is not a problem that I associate with this part of the world. But the subsidence issue is one oh, yeah, that, like over by Gorham. Oh, that's and, terrible. Yeah. Uh, and when I look at maps of how densely drilled this area yeah. is, you always worry that it wouldn't only takes one improperly plugged oh, well yeah. in, in, in right, wrong, right yeah. or wrong place yeah. to really create a problem. Yeah. But you haven't had to deal with that up in no, here not. yourselves. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, the change in, you mentioned water flooding, which is, you know, historically people have been doing mm -hmm. here for a long, long time. What about tertiary recovery and, and CO2? I, you know, we'll, I get where you would throw in there. People talked about how important tertiary recovery was going to be in this part of the world in a mature producing area. Has it been? No. It's been very disappointing. How come? Uh, part of it's crude price, but it's just a difficult thing to do. I was, uh, when I was with Shell Oil Company, <clears throat> they had done some long core experiments and they, they had a material called aqueous sulfonate that they would displace through these long cores and it would, to the core would be just black with oil and it would be just paper white. And that was a, they did it, we put in a, I put it, to, I did the field work. I was a foreman. I went into Benton, Illinois, and put that thing in, and uh, it was written up in the Shell Annual Report. And they really, there wasn't enough aqueous sulfonate to do. A, they were going to have to revise their refinery to produce it. But we, we got into a, just a fiasco up there. And it, 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 we did it in the Tar Springs, and it was in the Benton field, and it was the first. I had a. 1952 oil and gas journal. It was the first uh, five-spot water flood in America, and that they were still producing those wells, and that's what we tried on. It was it was pretty much a failure. We just we even Shell even built a laboratory, chemical laboratory in the field. To, to, and they were you know, use this sulfate. It's about like molasses, and comes in drums. And you have to put heaters on these drums. Of course, we started the project in the middle of winter, but it was just a mess. So, and then CO2. I, right. I was on KU's tertiary oil right. recovery for years, really enjoyed that. And when I became Chicago president, the first thing I did was go down to see Shell and have Shell CO2 come up here. And they needed a, a big field to anchor the project because the CO2 was going to be piped in. And they knew they knew that CO2 would work in the Morro Sand. They were very leery of the Lansing because it was a little bitty operators, and they they chose the uh, Bemis pool and it's an arbuckle, so it's and it was not a 
ideal reservoir. You know, they'd had experience with that in Texas on big water floods by major oil companies, and it, it worked. But it didn't there, and so they abandoned that. It, the minimum miscibility pressure was not acceptable. It feels a little bit like some of those tertiary projects like CO2 are always just kind of around the corner. Yeah. But okay. the corner never no. seems to appear. I've been doing that, chasing that for 50 years. So, uh, And I really enjoyed the, being on the tertiary oil recovery project. The state right. funded it, and that was some chemical engineers in KU. I really enjoyed that. They were doing a lot of interesting stuff. Oh, yeah. But bringing it to the field is another thing. In order to really apply that in a big way in Kansas, which looks as a mature area, Kansas looked like it'd be the place you could do it, you'd have to have really high oil prices and you'd have yeah, to have them for right. a long time. That's right. right. Now, they, they did do a lot of work with polymers. Right. And they did some good with polymers. But never got to the point where it was just production line kind of stuff because no, right. it was never economic, right? Yeah, that's right. What... Uh, this is going to be kind of a funny question to you. You may need a second or two to think about it, but you just said something about 50 years. So what's the biggest change you've seen in in this business in that 50 years? Probably the people. Really? You know, my son asked me, he said, Dad, you really trust people. I said, yeah, that's my generation. He said, mine does not trust people like you do. Uh, when I came back here, my father said, son, we ran this oil patch on handshake and a bottle of whiskey. You're going to run it on a jet airplane, a computer, and my, my son's probably going to run it on a cell phone. So the, the, it's just the, the close personal relationships. I mean, we really had them, and it was, you just cared about people a lot, Tr totally trusted people. So some of that change is technological, okay? Yeah. Uh, you, we, you, we talked a little bit about 3D seismic and all those the kind of technological changes and, and ability to monitor stuff. You just don't need as many people as yeah. you used to. Right. Yeah. Are you also saying something about the quality of people? Is it, it's, it must be harder to hire people out here. There are fewer people around. Yeah. Is, that, is yeah. that some of what's going on? Well, I don't know. Uh, we were just fortunate to have dear, dear partners. And I mean, you, you, our business model is to know every, know every kid they've got, know what they're doing, and just totally trust them. And that's just the way we've always done business. That's the way we pick employees like that. And their employees, we want them to create some wealth and own part of it. And if you give them that chance, they'll do it. But in terms of the kinds of work that folks have to do in terms of drilling mm -hmm. and service companies, that's not always a lot of fun. No, no. And finding people that are willing to do no. that is probably even more difficult today than it would have been yeah. 50 yes. years ago. Yeah. What is the, what, what is the answer to that? Or I don't know. I'm just worried about our country. You know, I'm, division and I just hate that uh -huh. what so I, let's go from looking backwards a little bit to looking forward and I know this is an oral history interview but you've seen a lot of change uh, what do you think things are headed I, in, if, 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 I, if, if we come back here 20 or 30 years from now I have the same kind of conversation how do you think things well things look much different in terms of the oil and gas business in this part of the world do you think it'll be just slower okay. and smaller and, you know, I'm, this is a great place to live in rural Kansas. And we're going to have to figure out how you make a living out here. And, and, and it, it can't be just agriculture and oil. Right. It, uh, are there still going to be uh, exploration production opportunities? Yeah, some, but it'll be small. It'll okay. be smaller, I think. And I hate that. We're wanting. I have a grandson that wants to come back into this business, and I'm worried about his future. You know, in the oil business, right. now, we can find something else to do, but we're going to have to be creative. 
So I'm, I'm reading a book right now. It's called The Deal Maker in Chief. It's about George Washington and he inheriting the farmland at Mount Vernon. And you could, you know, they'd been farming tobacco and selling it to England. And it used a lot of slaves, slow pay, not a good business. And he starts fiddling around with wheat, fruits, and you can just see his mind working on creating. And I, we're going to have to figure out something like that. Diversification, yeah, in other words, absolutely. is what you're saying. Yeah, we've, we've done really well with that. But it sounds like that's, you, you've obviously been doing that for a long time. Yeah, 25, 30 years. Uh, in some respects, that's not just your future, but that's probably the future of the area. Yeah. Don't you think? Yes. Uh, anything else that I that I haven't asked you about that that I should have in this process that you can think of? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there anything we haven't covered that you think I, that we should have? I I, and I will say I'm sort of intrigued with the timing on your Cuyahoga presidency. So I didn't realize you were responsible for nine dollar a barrel oil. Would you? Would yeah, you be thanks thinking? a lot. <laughs> uh, that organ talk a little bit about that organization. You and I talk about Cuyahoga as if we sort of assume everybody knows what it is. Well, you know, I I was a, this, out here in the boondocks, and most of the Cuyahoga presidents came out of Wichita. Right. Danny Biggs was the first one, that, and then I was, I was, and it it was a learning experience. I I was involved in several things. They had uh, Kansas Inc. Right. And I really I was on that board. And I really enjoyed that. They, we brought the NASCAR thing, in, right. and that was a fun deal. And I, I would, I didn't go up through the ranks like most people would. So I did that and went right from there to Cuyahoga presidency. And I, I got a kick out of it, but a couple of years out of my life, and that's good, that's enough. And Cuyahoga is predominantly, it always looked to me like a predominantly sort of a Wichita focused yeah. organization. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, and in some respects, you're kind of the northern most outpost. Probably, yeah. Uh, Danny's from Great Bend, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think if there were some, there must have been some folks from Hayes. That have yeah, been, there's a lot of people in Hayes. Yeah, uh, that are involved in it. But yeah, I do think of it as per, sort of dominated by folks in the Wichita yeah, area. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but it's not like that's a foreign country or anything. Yeah. And was it primarily Cuyahoga's role is to is is policy influencing? Yeah. Is that what yeah. you would say? I would say so. Yeah. Uh, Don Schnocky was kind of the first executive director that I'm yeah. familiar with. He was with me. Okay. Uh, and that was basically Cuyahoga's way, or the the state oil business's way of influencing policies related yeah. to yeah. oil and gas. Uh, I became Cuyahoga president, and Snocky had been the executive vice president for years, and came out to Russell. We read about. It. I said, "You're going to be here my whole two years, aren't you?" And he says, "No." <laughs> so I had to replace him. Well, that's always. I, I remember uh, when, when did he uh, when did he oh, retire? Oh gosh! I, I mean, while you were president, though. Yeah. Was it? And did you hire Ed Cross then? So no. Did, no. Was there somebody in between? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bob Crable? Yep. That's right. I forgot I, about and that. And I like Jimmy. Yeah. Uh, from, he's from Pretty Prairie. Yes. That's yeah, right. A good guy. He was a good guy. Oh, good. That's right. I forgot. He did, he did that not for a huge amount of time yeah. in between those folks. Yeah. Uh, and he had some environmental background. He was also involved with KCC. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and real quickly, as we finish up, in terms of the KCC, the primary person you've always dealt with, and by you I mean oil and gas folks, is uh, Director of Division of Envi uh, Conservation Division down in Wichita. Uh, and Ryan Hoffman is there now. Prior to that was Doug Lewis. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember who did that job. So is that your primary interaction with the state has been through yeah. the KCC yes. Conservation uh -huh. Director? Yeah. And they're very reasonable to work with. Uh, they're kind of a a, they have kind of a Kansas approach yes. to yeah. solving problems. Yeah, friendly. Okay. Firm but friendly. 
if something needs to be done, it, it better be done right. But if you're honest and you treat, you, you will be treated fairly. And they have a regional office in Hayes. Hayes. Yeah. yeah, and that's who you dealt with probably on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis yeah. when yeah. well played. Case Morris is over there. Okay, he has a geology degree. And okay, he's a good guy. Okay. So anything else that we should no, talk about? Do no, you think? You, you made. I was kind of concerned about this, but you made it kind of fun. You were concerned about. I, I, I didn't know what we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the the conversation because you've got a a lot of different perspective over a long period of time, yeah. and you're a you're a well respected voice in the industry. Thank you. So it's. Good. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today because okay. it's good to have well, that perspective. Thank you for doing this. All right. Okay.